Hey, everybody. Welcome to Commercial Construction Elevate the Industry podcast series hosted by yours truly, Dave Presida. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, the purpose of the podcast is to help you grow in the commercial construction business in two ways. One, uh, as someone who's been in the business now for almost 40 years, I'm going to share my experiences with you in uh, individual episodes. And the second would be to introduce you to industry leaders who probably, without this podcast, you may have never met. And we're fortunate today to have two industry leaders with us, and I'm excited to introduce them. Uh, Kevin Kennedy and Joe Bizzano, they are co-owners of Beacon Exit Planning. They're co-authors of an Amazon best-selling book called The Contractor's 60-Minute Exit Plan. They're both nationally recognized speakers on the subject of exit planning and everything that has to do with it, and they focus on our business, commercial construction. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Great to be here. Thank you so much. So let's start with you, Kevin. Talk about Beacon. Uh, give us a little history of Beacon and how how you got there uh, with Joe in particular. Sure. Um, well, Beacon, yeah, I'm going to give you a little back end story, which which kind of explains the um, scope and sequence of how this all evolved. Uh, I was a contractor. I was a we, we our uh, my company that I, I bought and sold a company. The company that uh, I was involved in evolved uh, from a contractor, a rural contractor of 35 employees to over 200 employees by the time that we uh, we sold it and it, it evolved into one of the top uh, uh, 20 uh, specialty contractors in the United States. Um, and so the story of Beacon is really uh, the motivation of it was really the struggle I had um, uh, exiting the business. And it simply happened uh, in the uh, when we finally bought the business, three of us, it, uh, we we concluded that in 1995, we were owners and we weren't even thinking about exiting. But at that time, going into the YK2 and everything going on in, in, in a booming market, uh, we were uh, uh, approached with no intention of selling uh, by two consolidators, external buyers. And um, we went through that process uh, and kind of reacted to this whole exit process. We didn't really have a plan. We were moving forward with our business, uh, going like crazy uh, with our hair on fire, trying to keep up with the growing business that we had. And we had two opportunities to sell and offers from um, strong consolidators at that particular time. We're approached by private equity, we're approached by brokers. Uh, we lead an ESOP, which is a, an employee stock ownership plan. And we eventually ended up with a um, management buyout, just like pretty much what, what, we, what we were involved in. And so that's the story of Beacon Exit Plan, the, the back end of the story. Uh, what you don't know is it was, it, it, we, we kind of were winging everything for over seven years and spent a lot of wasted time and money and uh, capital resources and emotional resources being distracted by all this process and frankly spent over a quarter of a million dollars trying to figure it out. So then I'm on the back end, I'm lucky. Uh, we sold the business, which most contractors don't sell, fewer than 30% ever exit. We sold the business and I was um, involved in, um, we sold it to the managers and passed it on to the fourth generation. And we pretty much were involved. What happened then is I was approached by my competitors to help them with the complicated process, which is called the succession process. Now we're exit planners. But successions joined at the hip because X thing is about replacing your income, selling your business, because that's where 70% of your wealth is. And the succession part is about replacing yourself. And we were real good at that. We were, I went through a succession process as a manager by our, my mentor uh, before we even knew what the word succession was. He was just trying to get us ready to run the company. And then when we took it over, we got involved as we just continued that succession process with a, a, little, a little more robust. And we got the the owners, uh, the, the future owners ready to, to run that business. And what succession is about is behavioral. I'm not going to detail right now, but it's behavioral. It's about getting your managers to a, a championship level. That's operations. So they can produce, grow the company and produce the profits because that's what teams do. And that's the way construction companies are. But the secret sauce is getting them into leadership and that's behavioral. So we had a whole process and outside consultants we used to do that. And um, so the competition wanted to know about that. And so I, I started off doing this with succession, but at the same time realized 
the financial part, exit planning, is really, really important too. Because you got to get that right before you dedicate yourself to the real difficult process of changing behavior and moving your your manager into a, in, in, into a championship level, championship level, and then replacing yourself. You got to find someone else not only to buy you but to replace you. You bring up one thing that really hit me, and and Joe, maybe you can talk about this. Did you say that seventy percent of most contractors' personal net worth is tied up in their business? Is that right, Joe? That's pretty standard. Uh, we've seen as high as 92%. If you're in construction and you understand receivables and whip and all that stuff, why would you attribute it to be that high, Joe? Well, unlike, unlike your typical W-2 employee owner, um, uh, W-2 employee, owners will take their money, their profits and reinvest. And so over a period of time, they've accumulated um, this asset that is just multiplied in value. Um, and rather than taking them the money out of the company, business owners understand that they have to reinvest, they have to grow, they need working capital, they need capital expenditures. And so what maybe started out as an idea 10, 15, 20 years ago has now mushroomed into this substantial asset. And um, statistically speaking, you know, 70% is not too far off. So an asset, as we all know, is very hard to liquidate, right? In this case. And that's, I think, where you guys come in. So, Kevin, if you could continue uh, where you were going and then how you and Joe hooked up. Yeah, so, so I went back to school for two years. I went back to school for two years. I met, I met Joe. And uh, became, um, we became uh, kind of our, our educational. Like he's my classroom buddy. Because I, had, I had to travel to Boston to Suffolk University for most of our meetings. And um, that, that, to me, was a seven-hour drive from where I lived. So I uh, and so we got there and we always had to be remote. And I got to know Joe really, really well. And, and Joe was always because he's uh, he, he has an accounting background and evaluation background and he really loves taxes, was always the guy, the last per person to speak, but the smartest guy in the room. When Joe saw his soft spoken voice, when he when he spoke, everyone listened. So he became uh, he also became one of my teachers on the side, you know, after, after class. And um, so I went into the I went into exit planning and uh, and people came to me for exit. So I had to get someone to help me. So the first two exits, I used uh, uh, an other well-known person in the industry. And I was disappointed in the results that we brought to the um, to the owner. I was hearing some things in class from Joe. And I said, Joe, why don't you help me in my next exit, which was the third exit? He did. And the results were like night and day. I mean, we were taught, we were, you know, we, we got involved in the first deal. We, we, we saved the, the customer several million dollars. Because you treated taxes differently. You treated the, the sale differently. Most of the contracts we're dealing with are internal selling to managers, because that's the most common exit in construction. Mm -hmm. And that comes out usually as capital gains. And very few people have the secret sauce to, uh, to eliminate or reduce the capital gains. So you like took that off the table. So you're in New Jersey, okay? Yeah, and Joe can speak more, but I'll give you the big picture. So if you're a capital gains exiting your business, um, it's like 20% plus Obama tax, I think it's close to 4% plus New Jersey. What is it? 6%? Yep. State taxes. Yeah. So you got 30%, you got a 30% hit. So if you're selling a company easily, let's talk about $10 million, you're, you're paying $3 million on Uncle Sam and, and, and Aunt New Jersey. And you got to do it better. And there are lots of other things that can be done in terms of asset protection and different ways of uh, pre-saving for the, the exit through some very smart plans that we can use that can just just save money all over the place. Yeah, you rounded out the service with Joe. Now, Joe, he said something that you love taxes. Now, I don't know how you love taxes, but you must be <laughs> you must be good at it, right? Well, I'm okay at it, but I'm not. I don't love them. <laughs> so. I read your book and uh, you really stress, it's not how much you sell it for, it's how much you keep. That's correct. So I think that's a big, big selling point. I think a lot of people miss it. Now I sold my company years ago and it was a, it was a hundred percent buyout. It was cash, you know, it was cash deal. Uh, and in one of my podcasts, I talk about the differences very generally between uh, you know, a, a managerial sale and in-house sale uh, and, and one to an external company. I think you can talk to the fact that the company is the golden goose, right? 
So whenever you're doing an internal sale, that company has to be rock solid. Otherwise, you're not going to get paid. We'll talk a little bit about that, Joe. A buyer is not going to buy your company unless it can pay for itself over a period of time. Right? So yeah, the company is the um, uh, is the entity structure that needs to be saved. It needs to be the um, uh, the funding source for a lot of the a lot of the exit strategies. But from a tax perspective, there's a lot of different nuances and there's a, a lot of different tools that can be used um, to help minimize tax obligations. Uh, too many times we see that uh, you know the good old um, easier is not always better. Uh, we see too many advisors that take the, the, the old approach that, uh, hey, this is simple, it works, but the reality is you're paying, you know, you're giving 50% of it to the government. And uh, unfortunately, because they're not specialists in this field, um, that's all they know, right? So they're, that, that's what they know and that's what they preach. Uh, we've spent a great deal of time traveling the country, uh, learning, educating ourselves, uh, executing, a lot of different strategies so that we can minimize uh, the tax burden. Um, and there's, you know, there's certain situations where you just can't do that much. But for the majority of the people out there that are looking to sell, you know, proper planning is going to help with that. Uh, you know, even if you can save 10 basis points, that's substantial. That's 10 basis points that's going in your pocket. So if I said, if I came to you guys and said, hey, I got to, I'm going to sell my company to my employees. All they're going to do is gross up my salary over a period of the next 10 years, it's gonna work, right? What would you say? Yeah, that's that's the, part, the specific one that I was referring to, right? That's easy. I can just gross it out to my employees. They will pay taxes on that money and then they're gonna send me a check and then I'm gonna to have to pay taxes on that money. So, you know, uh, yeah, I may only pay 30% in, in capital gains tax, but what's the company paying? So that number has to be grossed up in order to pay taxes on the employee level. Um, and then I've got to pay taxes. So it, it's kind of a, again, it's simple, but it's foolish. It's like a triple whammy. Yeah. yeah and we see it all too often. Now it's a little bit more um, uh, bearable now that the rates are, are a little bit lower, but it's still, uh, I always say, you know, why, why should we leave a tip? Plus the rates, why leave a tip? And plus the rates could change, right? Exactly. And it could change, especially over a longer payout. I always think of an internal sale as a longer one, probably less money down because the company can't afford the, the, the big cash outlay. Is that, would you would you agree with that? Yeah, and, and, and so there's um, there's two issues there. One is uh, the financial risk, or we call it the risk of not getting paid. Because as you stretch the payments out, you're taking a greater risk that those funds aren't going to be available down the road. And secondly is the tax obligation. Typically, and there's an inverse relationship to that. So the quicker you get your money, usually the more difficult it is to manage your tax perspective, tax obligation. So, um, but then also when you sell from a, um, uh, an internal standpoint, you know, we try to minimize the, uh, the ability to give away your control. So we want to we want to hedge against that financial risk by keeping the business owner with the voting majority control. So uh, you know if there's any bonehead decisions that are trying to be made by the management team, he has the ability to override until he gets bought out. Now okay. you can't. There's nothing that says that you can't give the your managers day-to-day uh, -day authority to conduct business. As a matter of fact, that's what you want to do because you're you're teaching them, you're coaching them to try to become owners. And so they're going to have to make they're going to have to make uh, mistakes. Hopefully, they're not too large of a mistake. But again, that's why by having the majority owner in control, remain in control, it can alleviate some of those bumps in the road. It's like a fail safe. Now, getting back to secession, that is why secession is so. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why secession is so important. But you've got to build a good team, put them in place, make sure they have everything they need to be successful to ensure a proper exit, right? Correct. So, Kevin, what do you do? Uh, and I know, again, reading your book and talking to you guys before this, I understand that some of these some of these exit plans are long, right? They take years. But what what's your what's your wheelhouse in terms of by the like the process? I meet a guy that's thinking about selling his business to internally to actually consummating the sale. What happens in that process? Um. 
that what, what, what you have to do is you have to set yourself up for success. And um, you're going to find out it's, it's just not individuals, um, David. It's, it's, it's also um, teams. Usually, it, because if, particularly if a, a company is over $10 million, you have, a, you have a pretty strong team there. They get close to 20 or 30 or 40 or $50 million of revenues. You have a very robust executive team. And uh, it's usually not one person. One person will be the CEO. But in that you have to have that happen. But they, they really work as a team. And you'll be multiple buyers coming into this process. And if it's a management buyout, it's going to be over uh, 8 to 12 years. That's a long time. And usually how the picture looks is this. Uh, ideally, if you're going to sell a company in that process, ideally, you should start having a strategic plan for your exit 15 years out. And people say, well, my God, I'm not even two years out of my planning, my strategic plan. I might mean 15. Well, manager buyout could take 10 years. Both, And when we bought and sold the company, it took us nine years. We had a 10-year plan. But for that to happen and for the CEO to begin to find out his replacement or her replacement, uh, they have to be. Uh, they have to have a process in place to find out who that, those emerging leaders are and who is going to be the next CEO. Then you kind of commit yourself to the succession process, and I mean commit yourself. You become less and less of the day-to-day -day leader being the CEO. You become more and more. What you're trying to do is become the coach and the teacher, and you're trying and you're trying to align that company. For like 10 years we begin the buyout process now during that buyout process the uh, owner is still going to be engaged in the business but he's going to be doing less and less and less and less i always tell we, we did one of the first questions we ask people when we go in to interview them david is this sounds like a silly question but it's not it, what's what is your uh, what's the longest vacation you've had as an owner you'd be surprised how many big owners great companies these people are married to their business which we understand. I mean, I understand, Joe, and we all understand as business owners, that's the way it is. A business is not just what you do, it's who you are. So letting go is a very emotional process. And we're just wired to be there six days a week getting it done. But my point is, the first question we ask, what's your longest vacation? And you'd be surprised how many owners take, they, they, can, they can't get away from the business for less than a week. And they say, well, okay, I'll be there for, you're there for a week. How many phone calls you get? Oh, maybe three or four phone calls a day. That company's not ready to exit. What you should be working on is being able to go away for two weeks and not get a phone call. I mean, it's okay to call once a day just to, to, be, to be supportive, but literally to be hang up the phone. You have a team there that can run it. The team can run without you. The ideal thing is the team, the company has to run with you without you being there. So now you have 10 years and then and you're 10 years in the process of the 15, you got five years left to go. You pretty much should be literally 90% out of that business. And it's usually a, 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 an eight, eight to 12 year process. You kind of aim for 10 and both of our exits were nine years. That's amazing. My, you know, my attention span maybe just, just is shorter than that. Elevate, 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 elevate. Guten Tag. Anyway, you'll get that in a minute. I've been in the air battery business for 20 plus years uh, from when it was a single asphaltic peel and stick impermeable membrane to what it is today. It's a big part of, of the building science. The business has changed. There are several manufacturers in it, but I choose today to deal with Dorkin, a German based company. Not only are they competitively priced, their technical support is great and mainly, I can always count them. They're there when I need them, in the field or during the bid. The biggest single differentiator between Dorkin and other manufacturers is they have a simple system. An example, on a previous job, uh, we have five different products to do the same thing that Dorkin gives me with two products. So Dorkin, I thank you for that. My uh, workers thank you, my clients thank you. I would urge you to check Dorkin out at their website, dorken.com. That's dorken.com. Let me ask you this. Valuation. I know you're both certified valuation experts, or I don't know what they call that, among other things, right? That's a big part of this whole thing, right? What is the company worth? You guys help determine that, I assume, correct? Yeah, I'm a certified valuation. I'm certified valuation analyst. Okay. 
So you'll go in and help the owner determine what the business is worth. And again, it's worth different things internally and externally, right? It's there, there's, there's different values on how quickly you're going to get the money and all that stuff. But uh, tell us a little bit how you would evaluate a company. What do you look for? Balance sheet, what uh, EBITDA? Top. Yeah. So typically, um, you know, the biggest thing I like to stress when I talk to the owners about valuations, um, particularly since we're always looking at historical data, uh, valuations are forward thinking. Uh, we look at history only to try to predict the future. And um, so if we have a, a pattern of profitability and cash flow for this business, we can reasonably assume that um, that historical trend is going to move into the future uh, with, with certain exceptions, if there's new services or if there's regulatory issues that come up that, that could have a significant effect either positively or negatively. Uh, obviously we'll have that discussion, but for the most part, we're looking for profitability and cash flow. Uh, secondly, we're looking to determine um, what is the risk of that cash flow? Uh, what is the probability for that cash flow to be sustainable and transferable to a new buyer? And that's pretty critical because many times these uh, businesses are um, not structured in a way that uh, uh, can be easily transferred. Um, in a situation where there may be uh, one major customer or the business owner is the key rainmaker. Uh, in those types of situation, you're creating a lot of risk. And uh, risk equals multiplier, right? So a lot of times I ask, people ask me, hey, what's the average market multiple out there for construction companies or companies like mine? Uh, I always hate to answer that question because I don't know the underlying uh, situation with that company. You know, I'll turn around and say, well, what does it cost me to build a roof on my house? And they'll say, well, I don't know. I don't know all the specs. Well, right. same thing, right? You don't know the specs. And, um, you know, you, you have a two, if you have two different companies, uh, same revenue, same profitability, um, one could sell for three times and one could sell for five times. Well, now, why is that? Uh, that's because the guy that's looking for the five times has spent a great deal of effort and resources to structure a sale of the business. He's made some uh, he's made some moves that helps reduce the risk to a potential buyer. Okay? So, so in, in short, that cash flow can be sustained and can be transferred to an owner with less risk to the buyer. So you have a, an owner who wants to make himself more valuable and he thinks he, he can do that by being you know, having more input in the business, but actually that may work against him on a, in a sale. Yeah. A lot of times business owners, just because they, you know, they've been working in the business for 30 years and they've been working six, seven days a week, um, they feel that they're owed something for that. Um, well, yeah, maybe you think that, but the market's not going to think so because you've just essentially um, hurt yourself by doing that. Right. And internal and external bit, uh, sales are way different, but even more so in an external sale because they know you're going to leave anyway, right? You're going to go two years, maybe three. An internal sale takes a lot longer to do. Let's talk about your relationship as partners. Now, I got a feeling I know who the talker is. <laughs> right, Kevin? <laughs> you got it. You got it. T tell us about your, you know, your, your working relationship. Um, it's interesting. Well, Joe and I actually, we, we chose to be, um, to work together because of that one deal that we did. We, we saw the power of each other. We, we, um, we, we actually, Joe and I compliment each other. Uh, Joe is the he's he's the technical guy. Quite frankly, I call him the brains, and I'm the mouth. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I I feel I, I'm very comfortable on stage. And by the way, Joe is not, he wasn't in the beginning, but he is now. Very very to, comfortable. On he's stage. Have to medicate myself before I got on stage. Oh, he's <laughs> yeah, he's just, and, and oh, most and, and quite by not the way, that, on the podium. <laughs> <laughs> but but Joe, that that fear is not unusual. But Joe and I, it, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, I have such professional respect for Joe because of the value he brings to our business and what we do and how this company has, has grown into a national a respected um, uh, exit planner. We're actually called the, the we're, we're America's exit planner in our trademark because uh, we, we work coast to coast. We have never had no idea. We have five we have five projects on the East Coast right now. I'm in, I'm based in Florida and Rhode Island and Joe's in Texas. We never know where our next company project is coming from. But what I want to say about Joe is that uh, Joe's 21 years younger than I am. 
And so Joe is my succession. Uh, when I leave, Joe has this business. And and so I have been, it's been, a, I'm, we're, uh, we're, we live the succession thing with Joe and I. I'm always thinking about where this company is going to be, what the company is going to look like without me. And Joe's, Joe's my successor. Uh, he, if something happened to me tomorrow, this, this, this would continue to, to move. Uh, if I, if I lost Joe, uh, I would be, uh, it's, it's hard to find a tax expert like very few people that know, understand, to have the tools and, and capability and knowledge and background he has. And I also have to say, when we started this business back in, in 2010, we've evolved. We have learned so much about exit planning and succession and taxes and all the tools from the various deals we've done with attorneys from coast to coast from Boston to, to New York, to, to DC, uh, LA, uh, San Francisco, Portland, Chicago, all Atlanta, all these different places have, they brought in their attorneys for these deals and they've, they've taught us some things too. So the tools we have now, the tools we had five years ago or 10 years ago are totally different. So Joe and our relationship, uh, besides being a, uh, an incredible professional relationship, he's, he's, he's become my, one of my closest friends and confidants. Joe, how would you describe the relationship? Similarly, differently? Oh, uh, very, very much similarly. Um, you know, it evolved from two guys meeting in a classroom. And it was funny because we went to a training session. And it was about exit planning. And in the room, um, we all went around the room and introduced ourselves. And, you know, there are CPAs, financial planners, attorneys. And this one guy stands up and he's a roofer. <laughs> What's he doing in here? I was, I think the roofing convention is down the hall or something like that. Not a roofer. <laughs> <laughs> right, so he, was, he seemed a little out of sorts. But, um, you know, Kevin was the guy in the room that could sell. And um, nobody really knew that from Kevin, but uh, uh, he could sell. And um, he and I developed a relationship. We both grew up playing sports, football and wrestling. And so we both kind of hit it off. And, uh, um, our relationship has evolved to much more than business. It's personal. I've been to his daughter's weddings. He's, he's been to family events of mine. And, uh, and you know, we always like to get together and have a couple of drinks and, and talk stories. In, in one of my podcasts uh, called Starting a Business, I talk about bringing on a partner. And you guys are, are the, are, I guess, are the, are the model because, you know, I advise people against bringing on a partner for money, for example, because it costs you too much in the end to get them out. But you bring on a partner who does what you don't do. So one plus one equals three, not two. And you're an example of that. So let me ask you this. You said something about uh, we've learned from others' attorneys. Now, every company, certainly sizable company, 10, 20, 30 million, even 2 million, they always are represented by an accountant and an attorney. Now, here comes Beacon Exit Planners. How do you navigate, A, through the owner who is already being represented both legally and his accountant says, no, I got all that, right? How, how do you navigate that? That's gotta be a challenge. Yeah, so I think um, one of the big differences in what we do and how we do it, um, part of my background is pretty diverse. Uh, I've been a practicing CPA for almost 30 years, always focused in the small business community and I didn't work for you know, the big eight back then, and these large mega companies, always working with startup through multi hundred million dollar companies. So I know the owner, I know the mechanics, the workings of a, of a small business, closely held business. I've got into business valuations, which kind of accelerated that knowledge and experience and, and really understanding the workings of the business. But then I also got involved in, um, I have my life and health license, I have my securities license, um, um, I've, I've represented buyers and sellers in, in uh, transactions. So my, my base and my experience is pretty diverse. And um, while um, a typical business owner has advisors, he doesn't understand the language that they speak. And um, because of my knowledge and my experience, I can speak all the different languages with all the different advisors and provide some um, substantial results. And it's not like we're going in there and replacing anybody. Um, this is a team effort. We like to say we play well in the sandbox with the other kids. And uh, that's the way it should be. Because at the end of the day, it's really it's the business owner's interest that we need to consider, not our own. That's well said. And I, I would assume that 
Kevin is that, and I'll you use your word, Kevin, the mouth to get you in. And then once you get it, you know, you roll up the sleeves, they know you, they understand right away that you add value. You both add value. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, we've, as Kevin said, uh, throughout the country, we've worked with uh, contractors and um, some of the ideas that we've brought to the table have just floored our clients. And the typical question we get is, well, why isn't my accountant told me this? And um, they've paid me the Because he's got a hundred other clients he's dealing with. Right, right. right. He's, he's worried about kicking out the tax returns and the financial statements, and he's missing the whole picture of what's really valuable and what this business owner is really looking for. Um, but many times the business owner has paid me the ultimate compliment, and they've decided that they wanted me to be their CPA. Wow. Now, it's, you know, here being, in, it wasn't Connecticut or Texas, there's a lot of CPAs between Connecticut and California or or, or Kansas or, or wherever, and uh, they chose me. So I think uh, I think we're doing the right thing by our customers. When we're dealing with these projects, we're dealing with a multitude of other people further than that. So you have your you have your accountant, you have your attorney, which we both need in the process um, because of information we have to share and things we have to do. But we're also sometimes bringing in, a, they, they, they might be dealing with a tax attorney. You might be dealing with a, you gotta be dealing with a valuer. That would be Joe in this case. Uh, you're dealing with uh, financial advisors. You're dealing with estate planners. You're dealing with insurance advisors. And you got all these multiple advisors involved in this process. The problem is they're not talking to each other. What we do as Beacon Exit Planning is we are a one source, one fee exit planner. We coordinate all those various disciplines. And once we have the plan in agreement with the owner, then we take that information to the advisors. So we're like totally doing this in-house and with the owner, they get them where they need to be. And then we take them to the specialists for the execution. So you mentioned you're, you're a one source, one fee exit plan. Tell us about that. Well, one source, again, because of our knowledge base and our experiences, um, you know, we can pretty much handle 80 to 90% of the transaction with the exception of maybe legal and, uh, and you know, representation, getting getting someone like you, Dave, involved that has a wide reaching net to get some sources if they want to go external. Uh, but from an internal transaction perspective, we can handle pretty much uh, just about every part of the transaction with the exception of legal because we're not lawyers and um, it's not a bad thing. We bring a lot of value to our clients and our clients appreciate uh, talking to us and listening to us and asking us questions and giving, getting feedback from us. And we felt that this is, this is such a difficult and such, a, uh, such an important step in an owner's life. The, um, there may be hesitation of picking up that phone and saying, oh boy, I'm going to get a bill for X number of dollars because I've been on the phone for a half hour, 45 minutes or so forth. We felt that, hey, if we can just build some time in and build what we do into a one fee plan, um, you know, we could we could have the communication we need. And we don't have to be worried about the, the, the customer is not going to tell us what we need to know. And it's just going to create um, Going to put gaps in, in our, our planning, so we decided we would come up with a one fee and um, one fee plan, and uh, that's that's it. One fee, as I hear you, means you're not concerned every time you get a phone call that it's going to start the clock's going to start ticking, and it's more of a relationship development piece than it is an hourly billable service, right? right. So, so you're really getting. Like, yeah, and the customer understands that we're going to be with them from start to finish. Excellent. So we're, we're there. We're going to be the interpreters. We're going to be the hand holders, um, guiding them through, talking to other to the other advisories, uh, other advisors on the team, so that um, again the message is relayed, the message is understood, and then the message is executed. And uh, and so we find that to be a pretty powerful um, resource. For well, I think you're in the right industry because being in this industry, I, I understand the difficulty of a finding a buyer. You, external buyers are never going to take the risk that internal buyers are going to take because the internal buyers know the business and they're, you know, much more likely to go on that. Elevate, elevate, elevate. Mark Twain once said, and I'm serious. 
It's the clothes that make the man. Naked people have little or no influence on society. The wardrobe was provided by Benchmark Clothiers, custom clothes to fit your lifestyle. You can find them on Facebook and Instagram at Benchmark Clothiers. And when you go there, tell them Dave sent you. Elevate, elevate, elevate. If you save, I mean, I, I understand you, you get in there early, you talk to the owner, you develop a plan, a succession plan, you, you, you put a valuation on the business, right? You got to make sure there are people willing to buy, right? And then you consummate a sale at some point in time. And I asked you this before, but I'll ask you on camera. Tax savings is a huge value for you, what you offer the owners, right? We talked about it a little bit, but but I think that, if anything, will go would go unnoticed. So maybe Joe, be a little more specific about how you would approach saving taxes for a typical owner of a, a $10 million business, a sale worth 10 million. You know, it's all about the cost of money. And unfortunately, depending on how you uh, categorize income, you're gonna be taxed at a different rate. So in current days, uh, tax environment, we've got ordinary income, we've got capital gains income, we've got dividend income, and now we've got this qualified business income, which is you know a rate in between there somehow. So what we do is we take a look at the transaction and we try to um, structure it in a way that obviously is going to tax the proceeds at the lower rates, whatever it may be. Um, we're going to look at the tax codes. We're going to look at uh, other tools that we have in our toolbox to help uh, mitigate that tax burden and uh, maybe even eliminate Quite a bit of it now one thing i will say is that you know with every transaction with maybe the exception of esop uh, all these transactions are paid with after-tax dollars so there's always there's always a piece that's going to go to this uncle sam and, and that's okay right but um it's the second layer the second bite that usually um is unnecessary to be tipped the, the tip that's right the big <laughs> i like that We'll, uh, we'll work with the client and structure it in a way that um, helps mitigate that, at least that second portion, but most certainly try to help minimize that that first level of tax as well. So I, I could add to that. Yeah. And just, just one more thing is, um, you know, with internal transfers, um, it's almost, almost counterintuitive in a transaction. Um, when you're doing an external sale, you want to get the highest dollar, right? Because you just get one shot at it. You're going to get what you can, get as much as you can at closing. And, um, and that's it. With an external, oh, excuse me, with an internal transfer, uh, you've got the ability to control it. And so maybe getting not as much is, is not a bad thing, as long as you can save on the taxes and maybe ultimately make more in the transaction than you would with an external. Yeah. So it's kind of back to that philosophy. It's not what you get, but what you keep. Right. And so if you can get a transaction, uh, an external seller, um, for 10 million, but sell your company internally for 7 million, but end up with 7 million and end up with six with an external. I'm sure the 10 million is great for the ego, but the 7 million goes a lot further in the bank account. Right. And what I would say before we get back to you, Kevin, is that you got to look at the value of having the money versus not having it. So all of these things, play, you know, are, are part of the uh, considerations that owners who want to sell make. And you bring up a good point. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, and also I just add to what Joe said: uh, selling externally and selling internally. You sell externally, you're not, you're out of a job the next day. If you're selling internally, you're still getting paid, and you're still getting benefits for a, a certain period of time before you do sell, or even when you're selling. Um, my, so let me let me go where I was going to interject with uh, with with uh, with Joe is uh, about taxes. And so we exited our businesses. We we sold, we sold to the uh, managers, the fourth generation managers. I was out of the business. So I went back to school for exit planning and I was in, in, in Suffolk University uh, two years after I left the business. And we're having a uh, information on taxes. A couple of the, um, uh, we've been told about taxes and the, and the exits. And we had a couple of the uh, um, existing members of our educational, our, our classmates teaching and, and Joe was teaching. And he was doing an example of a uh, internal exit and I'm watching very intently because that's what we did, manage a buyout internal and internally. And uh, he's putting out these figures and using a $10 million 
a business so you could understand the proportion and percentage of the taxes and where they're going and how it flowed. And when he finished, uh, I, when he was teaching, I could almost feel my stomach burning because what he was demonstrating are unnecessary taxes that we had paid in our exit that ended up costing us several million dollars. And uh, so when I heard that, I, I pulled Joe aside after the class and we went did it down the paper. And it's true, we've not, we was beyond several million dollars. And uh, it was then I realized how much you don't know what you don't know. And I, I, I was fine, I was out of business. And I, my financial future was already set, but that additional money was given away to the government because of the uh, cookie cutter advice we received from our advisors of over 30 years. And I'll say Ivy League advisors of over 30 years. They didn't know what they didn't know. So we were called the, the, the psych. I would use and they're good guys. They were, I, I never had any, uh, I never uh, judged them differently. They didn't, they didn't do this intentionally, but they didn't know what they didn't know. Well, they were you look, at, look at doctors, right? You think all doctors know everything, right? They don't. They're different. So, you know, I think they're all good people, but they just, they're, they have different skill sets and skill levels. Let me tee it up for you guys. <laughs> if, if I was a business owner contemplating an internal sale or a sale in general, okay? And you knew, you knew about me, uh, what would my next steps be with you? Well, we always, uh, we always, Joe and I, we always ask this for a conversation because we don't know who's coming in. So we, I usually, depending upon uh, how well we know the person, in other words, if they've been to one of our classes, one of our seminars, uh, one of our um, uh, convention speeches, or they've seen a video or something on the, edit, on the, on the or they read our book, uh, we usually ask for uh, a 20 minute interview. Just to uh, make, make sure, and then the whole idea is to make sure that we're fit and they have certain expectation and goals, which we we'll understand and if we can meet those expectations. Which sounds very reasonable. And that works again, out it's, we it's, do. The, it's the initial, very as you call it, conversation, initial I think call. is critical. Yeah, mm -hmm. initial call, it's a 20 minute call. It usually ends up depending upon, uh, you, you, because it all depends on what's next, but it usually ends up being like 25 minutes. Then I have mm -hmm. usually, I have these things scheduled for like half hours at certain times. Then if that works out, we say, I'll say, listen, do you want to take this conversation further? Are you interested in, in finding out what we can do for you and uh, have an early conversation? And we'll go a little deeper. And most of the time that works. And so we go to the next conversation. Uh, but that, that conversation is probably going to go 45, 50 minutes. And then at the end of that conversation, we'll ask if they want a proposal and what happens to have that. I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll give it to you from there, Joe. They ask for a proposal and then we come back to the proposal to see if we're going to do business. So if we're going to want a proposal, Joe, why you take over what your information you need and what your expectations are? Yeah, well, even before that, I think it's important to uh, get a sense of who the client is and uh, the kind of business that they have. Uh, we've had situations where we've had a, you know, a contractor where he's the business. Most of 99% uh, of his work is bid work. He's got no managers per, to speak of and he wants to get out of his business. Um, unfortunately, that's that's, can't that's help not, him. it's not much you can do there right we would agree that it's it's a uh, it's foregone conclusion that that business is going to sell for pennies on the dollar in liquidation but um, to get back to uh, working with prospective customers and clients um, uh, yeah we, we want to have that conversation we want to get to understand what they're looking for to see if there's an, a, a fit there and um, and then you know if, if they're interested and uh, we're interested, we'll ask for a proposal. Now, typically we'll look for um, some financial statements, business and personal, some tax returns, just to get a little bit better lay of the land of what the scope of our work. And then we'll set a price on what the proposal is gonna be. And um, once it gets executed, we start working. Um, and um, just to talk a little bit about our process, um, I think it's very important, especially the first part. Um, we call it a DAD discovery analysis and design. Um, the discovery I think is critical because so many times these transactions get directed in the way of the advisor. Um, the discovery phase for us is really getting an understanding of what the business owner's goals, what does he want to achieve with, the, with this um, 
with this exit plan. And, and it's not so much just the transaction itself. Um, we focus on the business, obviously, uh, you know, getting out of the business is critical, but what's the business goal? What's, what's their personal goals? I mean, for many of these people, the business is who they are. So there's a legacy issue that we need to get involved with. And particularly if there's family, and then there's a financial financial world that we need to focus on. You know, we started this conversation by saying that business owners, 70% of their wealth was trapped in this business. So if we liquidate it, is it gonna be substantial enough for them to be able to survive and not outlive their money? That's one of the biggest fears for business owners to make that first step into getting out of the business, right? It's I have control, I have this asset that's producing income, but I have control. When I'm out, I'm on a fixed income. And, um, you know, it's scary for a lot of them. So we understand it. And so we take that and we, we focus on each one of those different cylinders, if you will. And then we we also find that most of the business owners are doing this work, right? They've already got different advisors, <clears throat> excuse me, different advisors doing the work. But as we've talked again before, the advisors aren't talking to themselves. Now, too many times, all the different, you know, the estate planning, the financial planning, the business planning, it's just not coordinated. And, um, you know, if something catastrophic happens between today and the day that they actually exit, it's a mess. You know, it, it would create some major undue hardships to the business and to the families. And uh, we've, you know, we've been called in to fix a couple of situations like that uh, after the fact. But, uh, you know, for the most part, we're trying to minimize that type of situation. And uh, uh, so again, Getting back to the discovery, then what we do is we get into what we call the analysis phase. And the analysis phase is really just taking uh, taking all the documents that the business owner may have. And there's wills, financial statements, uh, state, you know, state planning documents, insurance documents, employment agreements, all those types of documents that are controlling the business owner's world. We read them, we analyze them, and um, try to identify if there's any areas that need adjustment so that we can make the coordination, right? That coordinated effort. And then we'll do the design phase. And the design phase is where we put pencil to paper. Um, you know, during the first two phases, we've taken um, and we've analyzed the business owner um, and this company, and we've looked at potential obstacles that they need to, or, or they're gonna be confronted with. And we'll provide some solutions to that. And we'll have evaluation, we'll run, um, to run scenarios from a numerical standpoint as to, you know, this is what you can expect to realize gross proceeds versus net proceeds and all the different types of transactions that we'll offer. And you saw that grid in our book. Uh, that's a real life situation where, you know, you've got one business owner trying or examining four different alternatives and the results are pretty, pretty substantial. The differences between what the company's gonna have to pay out versus what the owner will eventually receive. And so we'll, we'll put that down on paper in the plan and then we'll deliver that. And uh, we'll have a pretty substantial conversation with the owner as far as reviewing before what's he in the plan. It, right? huh? before, before he executes it, it, right. Before he executes, right. So yeah, so, so when we get to the this design phase, and this is part of it, um, we always tell our owners, look, uh, this is what's in the book. We're gonna go over this. We want you to go back and read it two or three more times, make notes, because we want you to understand what you're getting into. Because we don't have to live with your decision, you have to live with your decision. And so we are engaged to help you and challenge you, just as like you are going to challenge us on the different alternatives and why you want to go down a specific route. So that when you make that decision, you can feel comfortable that you're that, that is the right decision. Well, I love the full service aspect of it, the personal touch. Um, and you mentioned the book, and I'm going to say it again. I would highly recommend, if you're a contractor, read the, the contractor's 60-minute exit plan. It's a quick read, and it's really, really good. Well, I can't tell you how thankful I am that you joined us today. You guys truly are experts and leaders in the industry. And thanks again for sharing your personal stories as well as your business uh, and what you what you provide. I think you did a great job of outlining just how, just what you do and how it works. Uh, so again, thank you so much for joining us. David, and, and, th and thank you so much for allowing us to have the opportunity. 
Beacon is an educational organization. I know we're in business to sell exit plans, but what we do is provide this kind of information to associations, to peer groups. Uh, we do it writing, we do it speaking, we do it rec videos like we're doing right now. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to support your audience. And we uh, thank you for having us. Yeah, Dave, I was gonna, I was gonna kind of echo Kevin's sentiment. Um, we are, uh, as much as we are exit planners, we're educators. And um, we always enjoy doing these types of situ these types of presentations and we've presented throughout the country. But um, we'd also uh, offer you know, anybody in your audience, if you have a question, just give us a call. We'd be more than happy to, to uh, spend a couple minutes and, and just talk. So uh, we'd be happy to do that. Well, it's interesting. I met you guys on LinkedIn. I'm glad I did. And thank you again for joining us. And thank you for listening in. Stay safe and stay tuned. Elevate, 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 elevate,